Welcome to this video course on digital control theory. This course is part of the teaching unit digital control together with the activity digital control laboratory. The outline of the course is as follows. In the introductory section one, I uh, will introduce the course and set the stage for the remaining part of the course section two on sampling theory and section three on discrete time systems are a review of the course of signals and systems i will focus on the main topics and refer to the video course signals and systems for further details section four discusses the conversion of continuous time system to discrete time. Some material is known to you and will be reviewed. The continuous to discrete transformations and the numerical integration methods are new to you. We will also discuss the choice of the sampling period. In section 5 we will introduce the tools for the analysis of sampled data systems. We will see how stability and steady state accuracy, both for set point tracking and for disturbance rejection, can be imposed. We will also look at robustness and introduce the sensitivity and the complementary sensitivity. We will look at performance specifications both in the S and the Z domain and finally we'll review the root locus. In section 6 about PID controls, we'll first review the continuous time PID controller and then we'll see how you can discretize this PID controller structure. We'll review also integrator windup. A discrete time PID controller will be implemented in real time in the digital control laboratory associated to this theoretical course. Section 7 compares two strategies. Strategy 1 is to do the design using a continuous time model or process. This will result in a continuous time controller which will then be discretized. Strategy 2 is to discretize the process, the continuous time process up front, taking into account the zero order hold. This results in a discrete time process which is then used for control design. This is called direct digital design. We will see that if TS is small compared to the time constants of the system, well, this first strategy will work, but as TS, the sampling period, will grow, well, strategy 2 will increasingly become the best method to use. Well, section 8 will review loop shaping and take it to the discrete time world. Loop shaping is a method that you have seen in last year's course, Fundamentals of Control Theory by my colleague David Rouchard. Section 9 introduces Ragazzini's method, also known as model reference control. The behavior of the closed loop system is imposed using a desired closed loop reference model. We will see that we have to take precautions when we design this desired closed loop reference model because we have to prevent intersample hidden oscillations. In section 10, the desired closed loop reference model evolves from a transfer function to a polynomial in Z minus 1. This results in a finite settling time. When in addition we impose the controller output to settle in a finite time, we obtain the so-called deadbeat controller and this is covered in section 11. Section 12 introduces the two degree of freedom RST controller. This type of controller structure is also encountered in the course of my colleague Thomas Museur model predictive control. So you'll encounter also this RST 
controller structure for generalized predictive control and model predictive control with terminal constraints. We really focus on this RST controller and you will have to implement and design of course an RST controller on a real-time system in the digital control app. At the time of the exam you will also have to well, design and implement in simulation an RST controller. In section 13, well, we remind you that, of course, state-space control is also a digital control method, and we'll kind of see when to use which method. You will find the assignment for the digital control lab on the web page dedicated to the course, and it will appear there in due time. Some topics of this assignment are compulsory, such as the discrete time, real-time implementation of a PID controller with manual mode and tracking mode and associated with feedforward, and also the real-time implementation of an RST controller. I'm very much interested in experimental curves and you should bring to the front your understanding of the theoretical course. As usual, elements of originality are always welcome. There are plenty of opportunities to be original as there are plenty of algorithms that you can implement on the laboratory setup such as loop shaping, deadbeat control, and so on. The exam covers all material, so all slides, except of course those with the logo for your information, the classroom course, if there is one, the video course, and everything that you've done in the digital control lab assignment. The exam consists of two parts. The first part is a closed book theoretical exam. The second part is an open book exam on a PC with MATLAB and Simulink. You can expect applications of the course and the digital control lab in MATLAB and Simulink. If you see typos, mistakes, if you think that the course can be improved on, do not hesitate to contact me, preferably by email. I will really welcome this. MATLAB and also Simulink are important tools for this course on digital control. Make sure that you bring your PC with a pre-installed version of MATLAB and Simulink at the first and all other digital control labs. Take the time to do the lab assignment by yourself so that you know what you're doing at the time of the exam. The following references have been used in the construction of this course. The one that you see in bold, the books of Roland Longchamp, Command Numérique des Systèmes Dynamiques, are the reference books used for the section on the RST controller. And for once, it's a reference in French. So it could be that you appreciate this. If you have a look at the slides of the course, you will see that I have skipped quite a few slides on mathematical foundations. These slides concern complex numbers, exponentials and logarithms. If these concepts are not foundations for you, you should go and have a look at the video course of signals and systems. I have also skipped the proof on how you can obtain the result that you find here in the frame box. And this result says that this sum over here, where k ranges from 0 to infinity, converges to 1 over 1 minus q, provided that the modulus of q is smaller than 1. You can kind of see that this is true, because when the modulus of q is smaller than 1, then well, taking the power k when k is going to go to infinity is going to produce numbers that are become smaller and smaller. So this is why this sum is converging, right? When q in modulus is larger than 1, then it's obvious that you'll have a sum of growing numbers. So this will not converge. And as you can see, if q is in modulus smaller than 1 but tends to 1, 
well we'll have here a sum that will grow and this is what you see over here you have 1 over 1 minus q if q tends to 1 this will tend to infinity so this result kind of makes sense do not forget to use this hypothesis here on q and we'll use this later on in the course when we talk about z transforms and we'll have to use the definition of the z transform to find the z transform of some sequences in continuous time we've seen in the course of signals and system that you can model a delay using the following function so the exponential of minus theta where theta is the delay s so you can see that the problem is not in modeling but the problem lies in control design the problem is that the delay cannot be handled as a rational transfer function in discrete time and assuming that tau is k times the sampling period well this e to the minus theta s will transform in z minus k right so in discrete time it will be quite easy to handle the delay for control design because it can be handled as a rational transfer function so in continuous time this exponential function is annoying us when we do control design so what we'll do is kind of approximate it so for that you have to remember that the Taylor series of the exponential function is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x3 over 3 factorial and so on. We'll also be interested in the Taylor series of 1 over 1 plus x. This is 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed and so on so what we do is use this taylor series and approximate this by the following polynomial right and you can see that this one is approximately equal to well one over theta s plus one so what you can do and this can be viewed as a Pade approximation of order zero is replace the delay by a zero, right? It will be a zero that is on the right side of the imaginary axis, or you can implement it as a first order system. Okay, remember here that of course theta is positive right it goes without saying that this expression is valid only for small theta so what yields the first approximation the first order but the approximation is the following equation you can write e to the minus theta s as follows and then you use this equation twice okay and this gives you another way of approximating the delay and in this case it's a rational transfer function so when you're using a Pade approximation clearly you will approximate the delay function over here this is clearly visible in the Bode diagram so if you look at the second part where you can look at the phase shift you will see that this one will have a phase shift that will tend to minus infinity when the frequencies become really high whereas this one over here where you have a zero to the right of the imaginary axis will have a phase shift of only minus 90 degrees when the frequencies are increasing this one over here will have a phase shift of minus 180 degrees when the frequencies go to infinity this one will produce a phase shift of minus 90 degrees right and this one here again a zero to the right of the imaginary axis will produce an additional minus 90 degrees so in total 
minus 180 degrees when the frequency tends to infinity so these approximations can be used for control design as long as you don't push the bandwidth of the closed loop system too far for your information the transfer function that you see over here is the transfer function of a all pass system right and where is this coming from well you have to have a look at the associated Bode diagram right and we'll just have a look at the first part of the Bode diagram associated with the gain we'll assume here that it is ex expressed in db so we'll have a look at the first part that will involve just one over this polynomial so this is a first order type system with a cutoff frequency of 2 over theta so we can draw the both diagram so the gain is 1 so we have 0 db and then at the cutoff frequency well the gain will go down with a slope of minus 20 dBs per decade right so if we now kind of take just the numerator and we have a look at the Bode diagram we have something like this we kind of have the mirror of the one in blue mirrored around this omega axis here so we have a slope of plus 20 dBs per decade so if we want to have a look at the Bode diagram of the all pass system we just have to sum these two right because we are working in a Bode diagram where everything is expressed in db so we work with log functions and the advantage is then that you can simply sum you obtain the following Bode diagram so you can see that all frequencies pass through the system without being amplified or attenuated right of course there is a frequency shift in the very low frequencies you can see that there will not be any phase shift but in the very high frequencies you'll have a phase shift of minus 180 degrees well in this course we'll encounter polynomial equations of the type that is shown over here and they are called Diophantine equations or sometimes a Bezu identity what we'll do right now is see how you can solve those equations in the framework of this course the a b and c polynomials will be known so the unknowns are the r and s polynomial but the degrees of those polynomials are fixed so that you can obtain a unique minimal degree solution why do we say unique minimal well the reason is that when you have a solution r0 s0 you can find and we'll assume that these are the unique minimal degree solutions well you can find polynomials of higher degree that are also a solution and they are given by the following polynomials okay if you inject that in this equation you will see that this one will yield a z q z b z and this will will be giving the same term but with a minus sign so it's quite easy to see that if r0 s0 is the unique minimal degree solution then you can construct other polynomials of higher degree that will also be solutions where qz can be any polynomial the diophantine equation will also be encountered in the course of my colleague Thomas Museur model predictive control and in next year's course of system identification so let us take an example the 
polynomials that are known are a, b, c, and a is a third order polynomial, b a first order polynomial, and c is a fifth order polynomial. The two polynomials that are unknown and r and s, and here they're both of degree two. In reality, well, the degree constraint will come from the control problem. In our case, it will come from the RST control problem. So the Diophantine equation that we have to solve is the following one. As you can see here, we have a fifth order polynomial, right? If you multiply A by R, you will also have a fifth order polynomial. And if you multiply B by S, you will have a third order polynomial but in any case you have six unknowns r0 r1 r2 s0 s1 s2 and there are also six constraints because you have to equate the powers z, z to the fifth fourth up to z to the power zero so the independent term six equations with six unknowns well, this Diophantine equation can also be written as follows by simply plugging in the corresponding polynomials. What you can then do is compute the left side and regroup the terms by common powers of the variable z, and then you can start equating. For instance, if you look at the term with z to the fifth power, so we have a constraint a0, a0, r0 is c0 when you look at the fourth power you have that this quantity over here is c1 and so on so clearly you have six constraints and six variables what we will now do is write this in a matrix format as I've shown in the previous slide, you can start equating terms of equal power, and this leads to six equations. In this one, we are equating the power z to the fifth, here z to the fourth, and so on. This system of equations can also be written in matrix formats, and so here we have the parameters that are unknown, so the parameters associated to the polynomial RZ and the parameters associated to the polynomial S of Z. The system of equations we end up with here in matrix form can be solved efficiently using Gaussian elimination followed by back substitution this is something we have seen in the course of linear algebra so we obtain in this case here six equations right so in general it's the degree of r plus the degree of s plus two and here the degree of r is equal to the degree of s equal to two so indeed we end up with six equations okay the matrix that you see over here is called a Sylvester matrix and it can be obtained directly from the coefficients of the A polynomial and the B polynomials. Okay, so you have, well, degree of R plus one columns involving the A polynomial and degree of S plus one columns involving the B polynomial and as you can see here there is a structure you start with the A polynomial and in the next column it's shifted by one element and the next again a shift of one element for the fourth column over here so the first one related to the b polynomial well b here is seen as a polynomial of degree three okay so that the first two coefficients are zeros and then again well there is this shifting of the column so when you apply this when you're going to design an RSD controller you'll end up with a system of equation of this type so what you should do is always check the structure of this matrix 
and see if it has indeed this Sylvester between quotes for. Before starting with this course, I want to set the stage and give you a rough idea of what we intend to do. You remember that in last year's course, Fundamentals of Control Theory by my colleague David Husha, you have seen that a process can be very well described in continuous time. If the process is linear, then the Laplace or S domain appears to be advantageous in control design. The design control can then be represented by a set of differential equations. Well, in the old days, the continuous time design controller, that is the desired control dynamics, were approximated using pneumatic or hydraulic systems or analog electronics. And we'll see an example of that soon. Nowadays, of course, we work with processes. So we have to take into account the discrete time nature of the signals and the fact that the signals are quantized. Okay, We speak of digital controllers. What you see here is the electronic schematics for an analog PID controller used to control the motor shaft position of a DC motor. You can see here that the proportional, integral and derivative parts are implemented using an operational amplifier. Nowadays, as we've said, we work with processors. They've become the standard of today and they offer a number of well, advantages. One of them is, of course, flexibility. You can really decide to change your controller very easily. It's just a matter of reprogramming everything, compiling and downloading in the processor. Well, also you can implement much more complicated control laws, even non-linear control laws. You will see that control laws are no longer implemented using differential equations, but that they are implemented using a different equation. This is something that you will experience also in the associated digital control lab. Since the controller is implemented using a difference equation, well, the control law really is implemented on the basis of previous inputs, previous outputs, and it involves only simple operations such as multiplication and addition. What is very often advocated is really to use a high sample frequency, so a small TS, and to use a higher resolution, so a small quantization step, so that the sampling operation becomes almost transparent. We will see that this approach can be very costly and that there is an other approach, which is really direct digital control, which aims at including the effects of sampling in the design problem. In this slide, we present the overall digital control scheme. As you can see, you can recognize three parts, the digital part, the analog part, and in the middle, an interface. Well, if we describe the analog part, we work here in the continuous time domain and the associated variable in the frequency domain is the S variable. X of T is the input of the system. In general, we'll say that there is an actuator and then the process, but in general, what we'll do is kind of include the actuator dynamics, if any, inside the process. So the process produces an output Y, okay, which we call here YT for true, because of course there's the Y that comes after sensor and aliasing filtering. To measure this output we need a sensor but very often we'll assume here that the frequency response is flat over a whole frequency range that goes much further than the future bandwidth of the closed loop system 
since the signal is going to be sampled we need an analog it's very important to put this anti-aliasing filter in the analog parts we need an analog anti-aliasing filter that is going to remove all frequencies above the Nyquist frequency and then we have the Y of T that is going to enter in the interface in the interface there are two inputs y of t is an input and x of k is an input and there are two outputs x of t is an output and y of k is an output so y of t is taken it goes through sample and hold operations a quantization step and then digital decoding to produce y of k and in this digital controller an x of k is produced it goes through then digital decoding a hold mechanism in this case very often it will be a zero order hold to produce a signal x of t which is the input of the analog part well in the digital part the signals have been sampled so they're discrete time and they have a finite resolution because of the quantization step that has been involved in the interface step so we work with digital signals that are available every kts and well in the frequency domain the associated variable is the z variable well based on y of k and uh, set point r of k the digital controller produces an output of the controller x of k computer controlled systems as you can see contain both continuous time and discrete time sampled signals such systems are often called sampled data systems sampled data systems can really easily be implemented in simulink so what you have to do is take the continuous time process put a zero order hold block in front don't forget to double click and put the correct sampling period you put a rate transition behind again don't forget to put the correct sampling period right and then if you combine with the digital controller well you have here the sampled data system in the sense that you have access to the continuous time signals and you have also access to the well discrete time signals When doing digital controller design, you should always test in simulink and monitor the continuous time signal here in light green to see if there are no hidden oscillations in between sampling instances. This can sometimes happen if the design is not done properly. And this is clearly the case over here. We'll come back to that later. But in Simulink, using this sample data system, you can check inter-sample behavior. In some cases, it's sufficient to describe the system only at the sampling instance so that you have the signals of interest only at discrete times. We speak of discrete time systems. Of course, you can also simulate discrete time systems in Simulink. You need the digital controller. You need a digital description of the process, which is really a description that takes into account the zero order hold mechanism, of course. And we'll come back to that later in the course. If you simulate the system, you obtain, of course, only the description of the input and outputs at the sampling instance right but this is something that you can do in matlab using commands as i will show you now this is an example of the same result but in matlab don't forget that the design will be done in matlab anyway so if you're only interested in the result at the sim sampling instance stick to matlab so here you have the discrete description 
of the system it takes into account the zero order holds you have the discrete description of the controller and what is done over here is compute the transfer function from r to y and here from r to u and then it is simulated right and you have exactly the same results so in summary you should stick to matlab if you're only interested in the description of the system at the sampling instance and if you're interested in intersample behavior and you should be interested in sample intersample behavior then go to simulink so in your reports associated to the laboratory assignment test always test the intersample behavior of your designs in the analog dashbox the actuator and the process are often grouped in one box that we then call process the frequency response of the sensor and that of the anti-aliasing filter is flat in the frequency region that corresponds to the future bandwidth of the closed loop system so we can see the conventional analog controller as acting between the output y of t and the actuator input x of t as shown over here and this is really how you did analog control design in last year's course of fundamentals of control theory the analog controller is now substituted by a digital controller it consists of a program digital processor it receives the reference signal rk sometimes called the set point signal and the process value y of k which comes from the interface it produces a signal x of k which is then sent to the interface the role of the interface is to transform the analog signal y of t into the digital signal y of k this is really analog to digital conversion similarly it transforms the signal xk which is digital into an analog signal x of t this is digital to analog conversion and it needs an hold circuit usually the hold circuit is a zero order hold which keeps the signal constant on the last value until the next sample switches the signal to another level the digital controller sees a process with input x of k and output y of k so it sees the process with the effects of the two conversions analog to digital and digital to analog with the hold mechanism and the major effect of this interface will be that of the hold mechanism very often a zero order hold well there are really two approaches to obtain a digital controller so if you start from a process and we'll call it p of s and p stands for process in last year's course of signals and systems we would have called it h of s to stress the fact that it's the transfer function and that it's the laplace transform of the impulse response h of t here we'll simply call it p to stress process well the first way to obtain a discrete time or digital controller is to design okay a controller c of s by classical means as you have seen last year and then to discretize the controller right and to obtain c of z so the approach here will be the first approach the second approach that we'll consider in the next slide is the one that consists in first discretizing the system and we'll obtain a process description in z and usually we'll take the zoh equivalent this is simply meaning that we try to take as much as possible of the behavior of the zero order hold in account and we'll see how to do this later and then we use this description this discrete time description 
to obtain a digital controller and this will lead to direct digital design and this is the second approach that will be described next in this first approach the analog controller designed by classical means is approximated and we obtain a difference equation that we can implement on the processor we have to increase the sampling frequency so choose a ts that is small to make sure that the output of the digital controller is as close as possible to the output that we would have had with the continuous time controller if we choose a small ts it means that also that the control signals will change slightly from one sample instant to another as a consequence these small changes in both the control output but also the measured output should be representable in the resolution of the analog to digital and the digital to analog conversion this asks for a high resolution many bits so a small quantization step and this small sampling period combined with this high resolution will of course cause a high cost the second approach is the approach that will follow in this course and it will lead to a direct digital design we will consider the process between the input signal x of k and the output signal y of k of the process so we have to develop direct digital design techniques that will use the description between xk and yk to obtain a controller that can be represented as a difference equation it is crucial to have a good description of the relation between the digital input xk and the digital output yk and of course this description is influenced by the process but also by the sample period the analog to digital and digital to analog conversions of course it is the digital to analog conversion which involves a hold operation that will have the biggest impact in the sense that it introduces a delay of roughly ts over 2 well the main goal is to decrease the sample rate that is to increase the sample period with this second approach we can use a ts that is in general larger than with the first approach and this will decrease the costs beware of intersample behavior that is oscillations in between sample instance if you're doing your design correct this should not be a problem but make it a habit of testing that everything is indeed okay sometimes approach one can simply not be implemented on a given processor remember that approach one requires a small enough ts so that the effects of both analog to digital and digital to analog conversion become almost transparent this ts might be too small to run the algorithm on the processor so approach 2 which uses a higher ts and includes the zero order hold in the design is then the only way to go